This is the story of the Bernard family in St. Lucia. It's a story of risk taking and meeting challenges of living in the moment, but also of seizing new opportunities. The Bernard story is a story of hope and vision, taking us along a journey of adventure by making St. Lucia and the rest of the world better than how we found it. The family came to St. Lucia uh, as missionaries, as teachers um, in the church and uh, became business people and coal merchants and went into agriculture and uh, went out of agriculture into the service business, into hotels and tourism. Andrew Barnard, son of Craig Barnard, they are the torch bearers of the Barnard family history that stretches back four centuries. So I grew up in, in Denery. Uh, not the village, but in Mabuya Valley in Lakai. In those days, when I was a boy, um, road didn't even go as far as Viewfort. Um, even parts of the road to Denery were train tracks um, from the old days of, uh, of the, of the uh, carriages which carried the sugar to the sugar mills. Cars were a new thing and didn't exist. So you lived in this little bubble with horses and people. And for me, fortunate enough, with nannies and whatever else growing up, but the, you made friends with and played with the people from around Lakai and the river, uh, which went right down to the beach at Fondor and you chased fish. It was a very insular life in many ways, um, but fabulous. I mean, a wonderful childhood. Um, but I suppose what it did to me, it, it sort of uh, brought me I was a St. Lucian, you know, um, and it brought me into, into a way of life um, and a connectivity to St. Lucia that I never lost, even though I went to school in England <laughs> when I turned up in England um, and uh, started to go to school. Um, I'd get up in the morning, dress, and I would walk out of my dormitory, which I'd slept with the other boys, and the lady in charge would say to me, Barnard, where are your shoes? Because of course, I wasn't accustomed to wearing shoes. Dennis uh, ran uh, the Denery Estate, um, which ran, uh, it started right down, um, right on the, by the Denery village, and uh, came all the way over um, through Fondor, um, Richefort, um, and right up to Lacai, uh, that area. In fact, uh, Lacai is called Lacai because that's where Dennis built his house, Lacai. If Dennis went to, wanted to go into Castries, into town, um, it was by horseback. And they used to do that um, by riding on the Barra Barra Road, which went through Forestier and then down to Castries. Dennis, over those years, um, he was a hard worker, he was very dedicated and focused and he did a great job with Denner and he built up the estate into a, a profitable and very successful estate. And as uh, his success and, and the success of the estate grew, he actually uh, bought out his brothers Bertie and Cyril and purchased their shares um, in Denery. Um, so that he became the sole proprietor. As Dennis was building up the estate, he married Marguerite Tiny Laurie from Barbados, uh, my grandmother. Um, she was known as Tiny because uh, simply she was the youngest of three sisters and a brother. Um, anyway, Dennis and Tiny had uh, Laurie, Craig, Christopher and Rain. Um, and they were all born um, in St. Lucia and Lakai. The name Barnard is an English version of the original French Bernard and is linked to the several early wars between the French and the English. We know way back to 1066 when an, uh, 
the, with the Norman invasion of England. The Normans were uh, occupied Normandy, but they had been a tribe of Vikings that had come down from Scandinavia and conquered uh, northern France, and the King of France had had to give up his lands. They were aggressive people, great warriors. They invaded England, but of course Bernard, in the French way of saying it, is rather difficult for the Anglo-Saxons for the English, so it just became Barnard. From 1066 to 1966, 900 years later, Dennis Barnard found himself opening Malabar Beach Hotel on VG Beach in St. Lucia. Well, his father, Walter, who married Ida, built up the, carried on building up that coaling business. Um, and then they subsequently died together in London in 1918 during the Spanish flu epidemic, tragically. And uh, the children were put into the care of Colonel Thorne. Colonel Thorne was the administrator of St. Lucia um, under uh, the British government. According to the records, the Barnards arrived in this region in 1652, when a Barnard came to Jamaica as the Accountant General. Both sides of our family came to um, Jamaica in the same year, 1652. My mother's side were the lorries, um, and they were in the church. And they came down the islands like the Barnards did. And then the family traveled on down to Antigua. Um, and again, Richard Oliver picks up uh, this birth of, uh, the, the, um, of Samuel Barnard in Antigua. And his father was a Samuel Barnard as well, and he was a plantation manager. Um, Samuel, his son Samuel, was a mixed race man. He must have been born in 1797. Um, he signed a petition called the Colour, Coloured People's Act. We have the copy of the document in the family where he complains, they complain about the way they were being treated because they were not slaves, they were free men. It must be noted that Samuel Jr. was born in 1832. He married Isabella Parker, granddaughter of Admiral Sir Hyde Parker and his colored French mistress. Samuel Jr. built his home called Sanssouci on what has come to be known as Barnard Hill. Sanssouci, the house, was perched atop the hill with a panoramic view of Castries Harbor. Samuel Jr. and Isabella's son, Walter, the eldest of their seven children, was born 1864, about 150 years ago, and he took over the family calling business. Because Castries Harbour was a natural harbour with large, long docks, and the only one in this area, um, the steamships, which needed coal to fuel um, their power, they were able to come right in alongside and coal was able to be put on board. So it became a huge coaling port, um, one of the biggest ports in tonnage um, in the British Empire in one year. At its peak, the tonnage of shipping entering and clearing Port Castries amounted to 13.5 million tons and it was one of the busiest ports in the British Empire. Many will remember the incredulous scenes in photographs of St. Lucian women carrying baskets of coal, some up to 110 pounds, up the gangway to reprovision the ships in preparation for their journeys. The women were paid in tokens for each basket load of coal. They would either cash in the tokens at the end of the day or exchange them at most local shops for goods purchased, as these tokens had quickly become 
a local currency. The people that loaded the ships um, did it by, by hand. So you had guys shoveling the coal into the basket. You had guys who were employed to put up the planking on the side of the ship for the people to walk up with their coal baskets. And the ladies, of course, ladies always doing the work, the ladies carried 110 pounds of coal on their head you know, on a basket, 110 pounds per trip. As the coal industry was no longer a vital commodity as it once was in world trade, Walter, astute businessman that he was, shifted the focus of the family business to investing in estates in the early 1900s, first as producers of sugar and then bananas. Of Walter's three sons, two went to St. Vincent and his youngest son, Dennis, stayed in St. Lucia and ran the family estates. Everybody with a large estate in St. Lucia growing sugar was making rum. And the Roseau estate on the west coast and the Denery estate on the east coast both had their own distilleries. And so after sugar, um, molasses, which is the byproduct of, of making sugar, um, was, was used. And after, when we moved to bananas, um, we carried on making rum and we would actually import the molasses from Guyana um, to carry on making rum. John and Leonard Van Geest were friends of Dennis and they decided to m combine the distilleries together and they produced a rum called Denros rum. And Denros being Den for Denery and Ross for Roseau. The Barnard family bought um, the Geest shares um, in the distillery um, and became a 100% owner of, um, took over the distillery from uh, John Van Geest's son. Um, Laurie then set about, Laurie, my uncle Laurie, Laurie Barnard, um, set about repairing the still and increased the quality and put a new name on the bottle and that was Bounty, uh, Denros Bounty Rum. And slowly after a while he dropped the Denros and it became Bounty, the spirit of St. Lucia. Now Laurie was very good at making world-class rums. Um, he was a precise and, and, and talented man and he did it not just for St. Lucia, but he exported the rum um, worldwide, in fact, putting St. Lucia on the map. Um, and then um, from Bounty, obviously, he uh, developed Chairman's, uh, Chairman's Reserve and Admiral Rodney and 1931 and all those fabulous uh, rums that we enjoy today. Once again, times were changing and Dennis began looking in other directions. In Barbados, uh, a lot of the homes are built right down on the coast. And uh, Tiny, uh, my grandmother, wanted to um, have a beach home. And so she convinced Dennis to buy nine acres on the beach at Malabar on Viji Beach. And they built a house which they called Malabar. By 1966, uh, Dennis, uh, decided to convert Malabar into a hotel and he did that by building 20 rooms next to um, his home um, which was on the beach. As the Barnards changed crop from sugar to bananas on their estates, this brought phenomenal changes to St. Lucia. Not only was there a boom in the economy with money flowing from green gold as bananas were called, a middle-class society developed, which led to all-round prosperity. Tourism as a foreign exchange earner for the island soon overtook the banana industry, sort of probably in the uh, middle, uh, early to mid-90s. Today, Malabar is called Rendezvous. In time, Craig's son, Andrew, would also attend Lausanne, 
So both Craig and Andrew are professional hoteliers, having worked as waiters, barmen, cooks, and pastry chefs in concierge and reception, and managing hotels for other owners, as well as their own family business. So the family entered the tourism industry in the mid-1960s, and my father came, and came back to Sinusha and joined uh, the hotel in the mid-70s, uh, Malabar Beach Hotel, and then subsequently uh, had the idea of bringing what was a new concept at the time, and that was all-inclusive hotels to St. Lucia. And when he opened Couples St. Lucia, it was one of the very first all-inclusives in the whole of the West Indies. Indeed, the world, because um, it's in this part of the world that the idea of all-inclusive was in its, in its pure form that we see today was born, um, perhaps from the, from the Club Med concepts. Quite a few years, um, we had the opportunity to buy a hotel up north called Caribou that was being, what well, was owned by Germans um, and run by a German company, Steigenberger, um, and we were able to buy it. And we spent a year thinking about what we should do with it, and that's where we came up with the idea of a wellness holiday which had not really been uh, thought about before, ever. Um, so um, it was a question of thinking up a concept of a wellness holiday is one thing. Um, I'm quite fit and into sport and like the idea. And thought, well, what do we do? You know, early morning walks and stuff like that. Um, but what, what does wellness consist of? Um, you know, I thought, well, it's physical exercise, aerobic exercise, muscle toning, but it's restorative beauty treatments, relaxation, contemplation, sp spiritually healing. How do you create a holiday that offers those things? And that was the big challenge really, because there was no model to copy. Craig uh, took that idea of all-inclusive uh, holiday and decided to launch a new concept. And that was an all-inclusive holiday of wellness. And so in 1988, he opened Le Sport, The Body Holiday. It was designed to be an antidote to the stresses of the modern day life, um, focused on, on um, baby boomers, on stressed out business people, anybody who had an interest in uh, living well. And it was this fundamental idea that allowed, uh, that, that propelled uh, the ethics and the business direction of body holiday. It was the first wellness holiday in the world and continues to be the leading wellness holiday throughout the world. Innovation comes with as much challenges as opportunities and what was forefront in the minds of the originators was getting it to market. While we had the idea of it being a wellness holiday, um, we also definitely wanted it to have a Caribbean holiday feel. I mean, in a way you could say it was, an, it was a holiday invented for me as a baby boomer, my generation, at the time I was 40, let's say, um, and, and, and looking not to grow old and to stay fit and healthy and eat well. So diet was definitely a part of it, light and healthy food. So how do you fold all those things into and create something that had never been before? And it took, it took a year of thinking and a lot of help from a lot of other people. We had no doubt about it. We put that kind of holiday into Body Holiday. It was so special, we gave the holiday a name, Body Holiday, and the hotel a name, The Sport, um, because we knew the holiday was special, and it's always been special. It still is special. It's like the only one around still in the world that's exactly like that. Um, so that's where we started, 1652, <laughs> both sides of the family. That's roughly the story down the island through Antigua, uh, into St. Lucia, what the family did, um, and this is where we are today. Our business is a very old business and has uh, moved from father to son over the generations and evolved from industry to industry. And uh, I, think, um, I think that process will continue. Um, certainly in view of um, family continuation 
Um, we have that strong sense of family. Body Holiday, I think, as an idea, has a very strong future. The uh, people need wellness more than ever. They need um, a sense of well-being. People are actively seeking quality of life, um, and they they wrap it up in all kinds of um, memes on Instagram, on in social media messaging that talks about my value, my self worth, who I am as a person, how do I valor, um, validate myself, um, you know, uh, self care, all these kind of ideas um, that are coming out um, uh, due to, I believe, an, an extraordinary pressure on individuals in society today. Body Holiday remains as unique today as when it was first conceptualized. We said, give us your body for a week and we'll give you back your mind. So give us your body, we'll exercise it, we'll tone it, we'll stretch it. The world was getting faster and faster up to that generation um, and they were the leaders uh, owning most things and being the managers of most things and they were under huge stress and so the whole relaxation side of it was very important to them um, so that's sort of how we put this idea together um, and obviously uh, it's worked and it's worked well and we remain the, the, the leader or the almost the only boat sailing in our blue ocean. For those who have taken that indescribable journey their lives have been changed forever. Growing up in this, in this fabulous business and understanding it from the inside, working in all my school vacation periods, um, working in the hotel, being in, in it over the years, I'm extremely proud to be part of this fabulous business. And, um, and it's not just because of its history, um, it's because of what it does. The fabulous thing about Body Holiday is it reaches beyond the idea of just a vacation break. This is a place that actually changes people's lives and makes them feel better. It has an, a positive effect on humanity. Um, and uh, for that, I'm hugely grateful to be part of that, that purpose. What a trip this has been. And who would have thought that back in the day, way back, a Barnard was sent to the gallows for piracy. It can be that this spirit of rebellion and resistance ignited that passion for always striving for better. And who would have thought that yet another Barnard, Donald Barnard, who was the uncle of former Prime Minister Dr. Kenny Anthony, was a decorated squadron leader in the British Royal Air Force. His bravery too is in the Barnard DNA. That very bravery is something that we're all going to need going forward. The future will be full of challenges for us all in our small island nation that exists in a global marketplace which favors the large and the strong. I like to think that our values and core behaviors of love, warmth, care, empathy, trust, professionalism and creativity are going to guide us through the tumultuous times ahead.